our 2020 choir director and feast all around virtuoso musician, Mark Graham, who many of you know, and if you don't know him, then please take this opportunity at this feast to get to know him. He wrote a brand new song called Oh Lovely Moon for this occasion. He'll perform that here for us, and then after that we will have the opening prayer by Robin Weber. Lovely moon shining in the sky, light our way to happiness. As you rise up in the east, we begin God's harvest feast. On this night we glorify God who put you in the sky. Righteous King, riding from the sky, make the earth rejoice again. Bring your kingdom very soon, this we ask beneath your moon. Teach us how to shine always, as we keep your holy days. sky, light our way to holiness, leave the darkening world behind, keep God's kingdom in our mind, come before him on this night, God who made your lovely light. Thank you for this night. We rejoice before our Lord. Open up our minds to see you have one great family. May your spirit unify your people neath this moonlit sky. Good evening, everyone. Let's please rise, those that can, to honor our God and his Christ as we begin this festival of tabernacles. Our Heavenly Father, great God Almighty, Father, we come before you in the living Jesus Christ, exalted at your right hand, he who was the ultimate pilgrim that came from heaven to earth, that we might one day be with you forever. 
Father, we rejoice before you. We thank you. We love you. We honor you. And even so, Father, we humble ourselves before you that for many of us, we've observed these festivals for years and years and decades, and or maybe this is the first time for somebody. Allow us, whoever we are, Father, to know our need from you, that our lives might be interrupted by you during this festival, to see things, to learn things, to understand things, to know ourselves and know more than ever our great need for you to be the center of our life, to be our sovereign every minute and every day. And that we, Father, here we are in the Walnut Creek community, that we might be lights, that we might be examples, that people might be able to see the living Jesus Christ living in us, not only as we worship you here underneath this tabernacle, but how we treat one another as brothers and sisters in the family that Mr. Graham just talked about, but also, Father, that as we, how we treat and how we come into contact with the community around us, that they might truly come to know you by our examples, by what we do and how we interact. We ask, Father, that you will please set your angels about this tabernacle and about each and every one of us that are here, but not only we, Father, but the body of Christ, whoever, wherever they might be, you know who are yours around this globe during this time that love you and love your commandments, that indeed you will be with them. So, Father, we ask that you will guide us, lead us, love us, be with us, allow us to be clay in your hands during this time to mold us to your satisfaction and to the perfection which is in Jesus Christ. So, God Almighty, we commit all and everything in our hearts into your hands at this time. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And we ask all of this in his dear name. Amen. Please be seated. And now to bring us the announcements and to introduce the remainder of services, once again, Mr. Kuntz. I don't have a lot of announcements, but some of them are fairly important. One of the most important one is the bathrooms. Where are the bathrooms? <laughs> we have a portable one in the back corner behind you to your right. And then we also have the bathhouse underneath this building over here, bathhouse where you take showers and also uh, bathrooms. They're nice and clean, so we really appreciate that. Other, another thing, another announcement, is the um, service times. The service time tomorrow will be at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Most other days, it'll be at 10, but there is one or two exceptions to that, so keep check with your um, schedule to make sure you know when they are. Another thing that we want to be cognizant of it, the of rather, these um, uh, there are other campers here. There are uh, there, there's a road coming in past some of the campers and so on. So I caution you to watch your speed. We'd prefer that you keep it 15 miles per hour or under if possible. Don't forget also that tomorrow there will be an offering, so you will want to bring your offering envelopes with you. I know there's always, um, and I've done it, so I'm sure uh, a lot of other people have too, forgotten to bring my offering envelope and so forth, even though I had it prepared. So that'll take place tomorrow. And then really the last announcement is, and this is a redundant announcement, dress warm. I don't think I really have to belabor that point, uh, if you're here tonight, you'll, you'll know that some days will probably be fairly nice and warm when the sun starts hitting our building here and there, our tabernacle tent here in the, in the morning, but other days it could be 
fairly cool. So, so be prepared for that. Uh, try to bring uh, things to keep yourself comfortable. So those are really the only announcements. We'll have more announcements um, tomorrow. I, I do caution you also to be, though, aware uh, when you're out on the road because you'll have a myriad of, of different uh, traffic out there from foot traffic to bicycles to e-bikes to uh, golf carts to tractors to horse and buggies and everything in between. So be careful. They, they travel at different speeds than we're used to or that we tend to travel at. But with that, I would like to introduce our festival coordinator, uh, without which none of this really would, uh, would be taking place. He's done a marvelous job now. This is uh, three years in running that uh, we've had the feast in this area. It's never been a big feast. It's a satellite site. But um, uh, he had a vision for this, and we appreciate that because a lot of people can't travel that far. And this is a great location for it, so we appreciate that. Also, he is a um, local business owner, and he is going to come, and he is going to give us some comments and maybe a short message. I, um, I hesitate to say a short message, but, <laughs> but perhaps it will be. And now I want to introduce John Miller. How, how long is short? <laughs> It seems I have a reputation for brevity. So really appreciate all of you being here this evening on this um, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, this has been a, a, a project that has been going on for a couple of years. And judging by the number of people here tonight, it seems that it has um, gained some traction. But um, I'd just like to... Have a, I have a little presentation here that I want to share with you. And uh, so I'd just like to have a little bit of a conversation with you uh, before we get into the pr special presentation that we have this evening, uh, which is a pre-recorded video. But I did want to come out and, and um, just share some of my thoughts um, before we go into that, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface it with this. We live in a world today that by any measure is in a lot of trouble. Um, Judy Clare, who is in the audience this evening, called me this morning. She was trying to find um, a trailer uh, for a person that's going to be camping here and was having to, the, the normal ch uh, challenges of getting it organized. And, and finally, she told the person, it was John Miller, and it was Congressman Gibbs that she's renting from. I don't know how you get to rent from a, from a congressman, uh, but I've known Bob for a, a number of years, and he just dropped off the trailer um, this afternoon. And, you know, here's a gentleman who will finish his term in January, and he said, John, we have so many problems. The list just goes on and on and on. Um, so I, I don't think we need to get into a lot of that. We all understand that. We had a food summit on this, these premises just a few weeks ago. People are concerned about food. Um, but there is really only one solution. And that is a solution that I think those of us here this evening understand with maybe, I mean, we all look through a glass darkly, don't we? But we understand it perhaps with a little bit more clarity than, than some people. And the only solution will be for Jesus Christ to return to this earth and to take control of human affairs and set things right and become the king of kings. And that is precisely what we are here to celebrate this, this, the, over the next eight days. But look at the crowd here tonight. I mean, it's, we're, we're by any measure a small group. And... The question that we often ask 
is why are we here? I mean, I've heard that time and again, and I never tire of asking that question. You know, why, why do we come out here? Well, we're here because of the feasts of the Lord. And God took ownership of that and said, these are my feasts. So we're here because we're commanded to be, and there's so much richness and depth about what the feasts mean that, you know, there are people here, this is my 38th feast. I do know we have some people here for the first time. Congratulations, there are a lot of people here that have maybe done it. We'll do this tomorrow. We'll go through a survey and find out how many years you've been here. But I'd like to ask in just a time, a couple of minutes that we have here, a different question. And a different question is this. Have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt alone in this life and wondered, is it worth it? You know, why bother stepping out, standing tall for God's way of life and actually living out what you read in Scripture? And I would dare say, I mean, I, I, I felt alone. I felt alone. And, you know, sometimes being a leader is, is a lonely job. Because, you know, who do you go to for advice? <laughs> go to God. But the feeling of being alone is not something that is new to us or our generation. Some of the greatest men of God felt that. And I'm going to read an account here. And this is from the prophet Elijah. Remember Elijah? You know, he was a great prophet of old. He prayed and it didn't rain for three years. And then he had this, actually the scripture that, that we're going to read here in a moment, is immediately following this epic incident where he called down fire from heaven. And he was outnumbered 450 to 1. And God answered that prayer and fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, including the water that had been poured around the altar. And then he executed 450 prophets of Baal. I mean, that's, that's big stuff. I mean, that's powerful stuff. I mean, God was moving. God was acting. But you know what he did then? He went to a cave. And here's what he said. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I mean, why, it, it is a natural human phenomenon that, you know, when someone reaches great heights, the big letdown is short to follow after that. And Elijah, a man of God, who could call and do what I dare say none of us can do, can call on God and have fire come down from heaven, only days later, fell alone. And moreover, he believed or had the delusion that he was the only one left. The only one. You ever felt that way? And it's just me. The good news is that we're not alone. Elijah was not alone in the cave. I mean, you know the story, and I've, I've, I've been told that, you know, I can't take too much time, right? So we can't go into that. I'm just going to let your minds go there. He's in the cave. He's in the dark. Still small voice comes. But God had a message for him, and this was the message. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. 7,000. Here's, here's Elijah the prophet in a cave. And had convinced himself that he's the only one. And there were 7,000, God said, that had not bowed the knee to Baal and had not kissed him. He was not alone but he felt alone. There's a big difference between 
what we feel and what is actually the truth. We're never alone. It may feel that way. But God is with us. That's actually, there's so many facets of this feast. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, right? The Word became flesh and dwelled, tabernacled among us. So the indwelling of God in us is, in, is much more personal than even back in the, the days of old when he dwelled in, dwelled in the tabernacle of Israel. So, we're, so we are technically and truthfully never alone. We may feel that way. We may convince ourselves of that, but we're not alone. We've never been alone. Here were Jesus' parting words. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This, is a, this instruction is consistent with what he told Elijah. He said, go. Go forth. Do things. Go therefore, in this case, into all the world and make disciples and teach them everything that I have taught you. That has been a consistent marching orders back when the Israelites were stalled on the Red Sea. Remember that? You know, they're, 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 they've got Pharaoh behind them and the sea before them. And, you know, they call out to God and God says, Why do you halt? Go forward. It is in our paralysis and lack of action that we are most troubled by the feelings of aloneness. And we just need to go forward. Continuing, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age in 2022. That's a promise that we can all take to the bank. And the way he is with us always is in that tabernacling in us through his spirit. It's the feast of tabernacles that signifies God's ever present desire to live with us and among us. That's just, I mean, he gave his only son to make that possible. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special, and you know, the old King James says, peculiar. And I, I always thought that. Um, I, I kind of like that. I've, I've always been kind of an odd duck, you know? Amish guy lost his hat, you know. It just don't quite fit, you know. When, when, here, this true story. When, when we lived and worked in Germany, they said, John, you're just kind of an in-between guy. You're too American to be German, and you're too German to be an American. <laughs> so I always found myself somewhere kind of mid-Atlantic. <laughs> Peculiar. God says it's special that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, um, well, we've got, we've got a job to do here. We were once not a people. You know, this is a very diverse crowd. And uh, I've always really enjoyed that about the church. We would have never met. I would have never met Mark Graham and a whole host of others in this room, you know your names, if it had not been for the fact that we share this vision and the commitment to follow the commandments of God. And that's a cohesion and a unifying force that is above all and in us all. It doesn't matter where I've traveled, whether to India, which, by the way... Um, I just got greetings from people in India that have already started to celebrate at the feast. Um, and um, we were there some years ago. But 
If you keep the Sabbath, you keep the holy days, um, it immediately sets you apart. It does what God said it would do. But now are a people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of high theology. And we've got a, a video that, that I'm going to introduce, and I'm going to introduce it this way. Remember the story? Some of you may have, ho uh, have heard this. The, the little kid uh, that ran to his parents' bedroom in the middle of the night because he had this vicious thunderstorm. And the father tried to comfort his son and said, look, you know, don't worry, it's okay, God will protect us. And the little kid told his father, you know what, I know God will protect us, but right now I need someone who has skin on. <laughs> you ever feel that way? You know, God is great, you know, theology is wonderful, and you have all these great promises, but sometimes you just need a hug from someone that has skin and flesh and blood. So I'm introducing it this way because we have the privilege of a pr seeing, viewing for the remainder of the service, I think it goes for about 45 minutes, a video where we will, it will start out by, and this is, it ties into being alone, and I just want to emphasize, we're not alone. We're not alone. There are thousands of people around the world celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. There are more people keeping the Feast of Tabernacles today than in any time in history, I would dare venture. I don't have the data to support that. But we had a, we, we had, I had a number of calls just the last week before the Feast. People found out about it and um, uh, talked to a young man. I, I didn't... Um, uh, first time I met him, he's here for the feast for the first time. And uh, he, he just, I said, you know, 38 years ago, when I kept the feast for the, th the first time, I mean, you really were peculiar. I mean, it, it was, especially in these parts, I mean, people really thought that you were unusual. There are a lot more doing it today. So when we look at this video, we're going to be receiving greetings from people from Australia, from India, from Germany, from the United States, from Africa, all over the world. So I just say, remember that God will never leave you alone, but there are a lot of people with skin on that are doing the very same thing that we are doing tonight, so we will never be alone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this opening night service of the Feast of Tabernacles in 2022. You have all gathered together here in God's presence as we begin this feast. I know that there is an excitement in the air as we gather together here tonight, as is, as is fitting for the Feast of Tabernacles. This feast that we're about to, to observe for the next seven days and then the eighth day following represents a tremendous time in the history of mankind. It represents the fulfillment of God's plan for mankind, a time that will come when there will be peace and joy and happiness and throughout all of the earth. We look forward to that time, and as we look forward to the feast each year, it's only fitting that that anticipation builds, the anticipation that we call feast fever. We've been planning for the feast ever since the feast of last year. 
We've prepared our travel plans. We've saved our second tithe. We're here right where God wants us to be in the place where he has placed his name for this feast here this year. You know, there's a verse that comes to mind always about how important this time is and how not only we, but the, the hosts in heaven and all of the heavenly beings look forward to this time that is pictured in the Feast of Tabernacles. I won't turn to Romans 8 verses 19 to 22 because you know the verses, but it talks about how creation groans and is just waiting for the time that the sons of God are revealed. The creation waits. It's the same for you and me as well. We anticipate the time when we will be no longer chained in physical bodies and with the physical limitations that we have, but as we live and as we serve God, that we will be, become everything that he wants us to be in new bodies. So we're here at this Feast of Tabernacles. It is a time of rejoicing. It's a time for us to picture the coming kingdom of God. As we begin these days, there will come the time of the fulfillment that Jesus Christ has returned to earth. Satan has been bound. And now creation and man are free to become everything that God intended them to be when he created them for us. And so we're here at this feast at that time. You know, I think back to the time of ancient Israel when they would keep this feast. They would prepare for it all year long just like we do. Their saving of the festival tithe was different than our saving of the festival tithe. Their journey to Jerusalem each year was different than our journeys. They had to plan that journey. They had to walk or whatever they did to get there, as opposed to us hopping into a car or hopping on an airplane to get where we need to be. But they left their homes behind and they trusted that God would look over all their belongings because they knew they needed to be where God placed his name as the Feast of Tabernacles began. We leave our homes behind. Part of the Feast of Tabernacles, God says, is go to the place. Go to the place where I have placed my name. And as we leave our homes behind, we're reminded that the, this world that we live in is just a temporary dwelling place. It isn't eternal. This isn't what God had in mind for all eternity. It's a place for us to learn, a place for us to grow, a place for us to develop the character that God wants us to have so that we can receive that eternal life as we live our lives completely committed to Him. We're reminded too that these bodies that we live in that are subject to pain and suffering and all sorts of uh, discomfort are just temporary bodies that we are in now. We look forward to the time when our bodies will be made new, spirit bodies that will no longer be subject to the pain and the suffering. All these things are part of the Feast of Tabernacles when Christ returns to earth and His way, His way, is upon the earth and all people are learning of the ways that he has set for us. You know, as Israel, ancient Israel went to Jerusalem, it says in the Psalms of Ascent that they went with singing. There was joy in their hearts as they came before God. We're told, come before his presence with singing. We'll intersperse this message tonight with some singing and praise to God because we're all here to glorify his name and to remember that it's because of Jesus Christ that we're even here and have the future and the hope that we do. So we'll intersperse it with some songs that I hope will uplift you and inspire you and focus us all on the kingdom of God, the return of Jesus Christ, and what we're picturing here as we, as we keep the feast here this year. Of course, we know that Jesus Christ is the reason for all of this. He came to earth, he lived, he died that our sins could be forgiven because of his death and ascension into heaven, we have his Holy Spirit. Once we repent and we're baptized and have hands laid upon us, Jesus Christ came, he went to heaven, and he's waiting there, waiting there for all of us to complete the plan that God has for us and the development and all of us that God has. In Acts 3, in verse 18, it says this. It says, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Jesus Christ is at God's right hand today. He's waiting there but he's waiting for the time when everything can be restored to the way that God wanted it to be, the way he intended it to be, before man got involved, did his own thing, and rejected God's way, and chose and subjected us all in the creation itself to the ways of Satan, 
far different and far inferior to what God had in mind. The times of refreshing, as we are gathered here at the Feast of Tabernacles, that time of restoration will begin. People will live different lives. They will, they will be taught God's word. Satan will be banished. And there will be a lot of work that needs to be done, but people as they live God's way of life, they will learn, they will learn the joy and the peace and the contentment that comes from yielding to God. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. We are here to bring glory to his name, as we have done by following his command and coming here to the feast, to the feast wherever it is that you're keeping it. Verse 11 of Psalm 96 says, Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. You see the same, the same sentiment that was there in Romans 8, verse 19. The earth is waiting for this time to be renewed. For he is coming, verse 13, he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. That's what we picture. That's what we should be feeling. That's what we should, we should be remembering as we go through the feast. And as the earth is under Christ's reign, and as people learn to treat it with the respect and with the, the uh, adherence to the, the instructions that God gave for keeping the earth, we will see it renewed just as, just as Christ uh, said, or just as it was inspired in Acts 3. In Isaiah 35, words you'll probably hear later on in the feast as well, but to focus us on it and put it into our minds, it talks about that time of restoration and how beautiful the earth will be. Isaiah 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It will blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Back in the book of Revelation, we see the hosts in heaven rejoicing as the time of Christ's return to this earth draws near. Just to read a few of the, the, the scriptures there and their praise that they give to God as they look forward to this time. Revelation 5 and verse 11 says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, all of them rejoicing, all of them praying God, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Just listen to that praise. That same praise should be in our hearts and in our minds as well. Again in Revelation, this time in chapter 11. Chapter 11 and verse 16. The 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. At the time of Christ's return, that's done. We are those saints that is mentioned there if we continue to follow God and let him lead and guide us through his Holy Spirit for the rest of our lives. And finally, in Revelation 19, it says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Alleluia, 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 alleluia.
The truth of God, the plan of God, the creation of God, it's an amazingly beautiful thing, isn't it? God wants all men to experience that. He wants all of mankind to be able to experience the love, the joy, the peace, the abundance that he had always intended, but that mankind himself chose another way and forfeited all those blessings that God would have given him. Again, we're here at this feast to picture the time when mankind will begin to experience how good and how wonderful it is to live under the way of God. The things that you and I have the opportunity to learn and to apply into our lives today. And as we do that, we see those blessings. We feel that, that peace. We feel that serenity. We feel that commitment. And we feel that establishment that God wants us to have as we build our trust and we build our hope and we build our faith in him. You know, God's truth is a precious, precious thing as you hear probably every Sabbath that you are, that you are at services. The precious, the precious truth of God is the most important thing in our lives that we have. And it's here in that Bible that's sitting on your laps, this Bible that's sitting here on the podium in front of me. We need to learn to live by every word of that. You know, Jesus Christ said that he was sanctified by the truth as he lived on earth, and he sets us apart. He sanctifies us by his truth. We live by this word, the very same word that the people in the millennium will learn, that they will apply into their lives, and they will hunger and thirst after it, the same way you and I should be hungering and thirsting and adhering to that word and making sure that it is in our lives, that it guides us and directs us. That truth that we come to know, that we continue to learn throughout our lives, that truth that we must come to love, especially as we face tougher times ahead of us between now and the, that return of Jesus Christ. In that day, in the kingdom, truth, truth will reign. You know, God uses some fitting analogies as he talks about truth and his Holy Spirit in the Bible. One of those we find in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 26, and this series of verses God is talking about the marriage relationship between man and woman. But he references that, that that relationship is a reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church, the body that he has placed us in. And in Ephesians 5, in verse 26, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Why? That he might sanctify it and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word the washing of water by the word. You know, as we read the Bible, as we learn the Bible, as we look into it and compare it to what, how we live our lives, how we think, act, and react, we find that there is that washing of the water of the word. When we see ourselves in the faults and then use God's Holy Spirit to wash away those faults and weaknesses and attitudes, there is that washing as God speaks to us through the word that he has reserved for us his truth, washed by the water of the word. The Holy Spirit is compared to water as well. We go back to the Old Testament in Ezekiel when it's speaking of the time when Christ will return in Ezekiel 36 and verse 25. He talks about this time that we're picturing now, the Feast of Tabernacles. In verse 25 of Ezekiel 36, he says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean i will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols i will give you a new heart i will put a new spirit within you i will take the heart of stone out of your flesh i will give you a heart of flesh i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them his holy spirit he will sprinkle us with it. He will give that to us. In Joel 2 and verse 28 and 29, it talks about God pouring out the Spirit on the people of that day. That Spirit that's so valuable that without it, we cannot possibly live God's way of life. Without it, we cannot possibly be in that kingdom and be there part of it when Jesus Christ returns where he wants us to be and doing the things that he wants us to do. It's in this lifetime we learn those things as we use and are led by his Holy Spirit that he pours out on us in that time and in that reflection of how it is that we receive the Holy Spirit. In that day, 
when people are on earth in Christ's kingdom, Isaiah 2 verses 2 through 4 says that they will all go up. They will go to the mountain of the Lord. They will look to him. The law will go from Zion. It's a beautiful time because the people that are there will be seeking God's truth. They will be eager to learn. They will go to his house to learn the things just similar to the way that you and I have come to the Feast of Tabernacles. We're here to honor God, to glorify him, to be, to learn the things that he has brought us here to. And being at services every day and hearing those words of instruction and inspiration, those words that can create the vision of the kingdom of God and hone it more perfectly or more clearly in our minds is a very, very, very important part of our observance of the feast. In Zechariah 8, Zechariah 8 and verse 20, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Eternal and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself also will go. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before him. That's what we've done. That's what we're here for. That's why we've come to the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, every day during the feast, there will be a service. I know that there's holy convocations on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles and on the eighth day or the last great day, but there's a service every single day during the feast. Have we come to the Feast of Tabernacles to go to the mountain of the Lord and to hear his word, to seek his law, to seek his instruction, to be inspired by the word of God? That's what we're here for. You know, in Hebrews 10, verse 25, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It doesn't say on just the Sabbath day. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. God gives us this once a year opportunity for eight straight days and nine when you consider the opening night service, nine straight days that we can assemble together before him, nine straight days that we can hear his message, that God can speak to us and that we can be here together in his presence. Don't neglect. Don't forget those things. Make that the important part of your feast. Of course, we know that there are other activities at the feast as well, and that's well and good. God wants us to have fun. When we're obeying God and doing his will, fun becomes even more fun. All of our teens and preteens who go to summer camps each year, they, they can tell you that. They experience that. They have great times, unlike any other time they have during the year, because they're there together every day. They are immersed and they are begin their day with God's word. And the fun they have when they're sharing their experiences with people of like minds, they'll tell you it's like unlike any other thing they do in life. So it should be for you and me as we're here at the Feast of Tabernacles that we're together. We've come out of the world, that God has called us out of the world to come to this place, to be together and to be before his presence, to hear his word, but also to have fun. In Habakkuk 2, 14, in that day, the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And these nine days that we're here and in our lives, the knowledge of God, the truth of God should guide us and be in our lives as the waters cover the sea. In Zechariah 14, a few chapters ahead in Zechariah 14, he talks about, he talks about the time the time of God and the time of waters. In Zechariah 14, verse 8, it says, In that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea, and both summer and winter it shall occur. And the Lord, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name one. Waters, we're told, will go forth from Jerusalem healing waters, healing waters that the whole world needs to hear. As we live, as we live and as we go through this Feast of Tabernacles, each day being able to have, enjoy the activities that have been planned, to be at services each day, to immerse ourselves in the way of God in this time, we'll find ourselves thirsting for God's way more and more. We'll find ourselves praying more and more for God's kingdom to come when everyone can enjoy this. In John 7 and verse 37, the Bible says on that last day, 
that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried aloud to the Jews and the Pharisees and the chief priests. He addressed the assembled crowd. If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and he'll never thirst again. And from out of his mouth living water shall flow Everlasting life for all men
In Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, God talks about the importance of Jerusalem, as I've previously mentioned, but let's read those scriptures. In Isaiah 2, verse 2, it says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations will flow to it. Many people will come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the eternal from Jerusalem. The teaching in the millennium will come from Jerusalem, which has a prominent place in world history, has a prominent place in the here and now, has a prominent place in the kingdom, and has a prominent place in the time beyond the time of this physical earth. Teaching will go out from Jerusalem. People will flow to it. The law will go forth from Jerusalem. There will be teaching then, just like there is teaching today. And people will have that as part of their everyday lives like you and I should have. At home, they will be teaching their children in the way that we see described in Deuteronomy 6. God will just be part of the family. He will be there as part of the conversations. Children will grow up knowing God is real, He is present, He is always there, and that family is to follow His way, and when we follow His way, peace, and all those, all those good things in life come to us. We talked about teaching and the teaching that will go on during the first Feast of Tabernacles. There's activities that are, are there at each Feast of Tabernacles as well. The coordinators have planned some things so people can be together. When we're doing God's will, when we're with God's people, when we're putting first things first, and putting God first, the fun becomes even more fun. And like our children that attend summer camps, as I mentioned, they can tell you the fun they have there exceeds any of the fun that they have with any of their other compadres the rest of the year. When we are doing God's way, everything, everything is better. There will be services every day, there will be activities every day. Go to services every day, but also participate in the activities that, are, that have been planned and scheduled there at the feast. Be with God's people. It's fine to go off here once in a while and, and do some independent things on your own, but take the time to be with God's people. We are here to come out of the world, to be with Him, to be with His people, to be there in this place that He has set His name for you to be, to learn and experience and have a foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. You know, in Jerusalem, when Jesus Christ reigns in Jerusalem and the law goes forth from Jerusalem, it'll far be a far different place than it is today. Jerusalem today and Jerusalem throughout history has just been a place of trouble. Always, always something going on there, not a very peaceful place to live for any length of time. But in that day, in that day, Jerusalem will be different. Jerusalem will be, will be a better place to live. People will want to live there. In Zechariah 8 and verse 1, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous. I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor, I am zealous for her. God loves Jerusalem. Thus says the Eternal, I will return to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. That's what it will be known for in that day. Not the things that it's known for today, a very confused city, as Satan does everything he can to make Jerusalem a continually unsettled place. But in the millennium, it will be a place of truth, the mountain that people will seek to go to. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of great age. The streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. I don't know what Jerusalem is like today, but I know when you watch news reports, you can be sitting in a street and have any missile from anywhere come upon you at any time. Not a place of peace, not a place that you would want to feel at ease there. But in that day, under Christ's rule, the violence, 
the war, the strife will disappear. Jerusalem will be a place of peace. Jerusalem will be a place of truth. Jerusalem will be a place that people want to go to. Psalm 87 and verse 1, it says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you. One of the songs of ascent that they might have sung as they were on their journey to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Unleavened Bread where they journeyed to Jerusalem back in ancient Israel. Psalm 122 is dedicated to Jerusalem. Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. When the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment. The thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When peace comes to Jerusalem, Christ will have returned. There will be a temple there. There will be people flowing to Jerusalem there. And as we progress through the millennial time of God, that Jesus Christ is on earth, we come to the time that the plan of God is complete. The purpose for the physical creation is done. The time of physical man is done. Mankind continues in beyond that time of the physical earth. But the rest of it is history, but not Jerusalem, not Jerusalem. The eighth day or the last great day pictures the time of the white throne judgment. We'll observe that eight days from now at the end of this time that we're together. In Revelation 21, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. There I, or then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God in that new Jerusalem. When God comes to earth and dwells with man on the new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Don't we look forward to those times? Don't we yearn for those times when everything is in order, everything is peaceful, all the, all the strife and misery that this world brings upon us that we become too conditioned to, and we don't even know what it will be like when all things are made new and when Christ reigns the earth. The new Jerusalem, that holy city that will come down from heaven adorned as a bride prepared for her husband. There's a lot that we picture during these eight days we'll be together. A lot of God's plan as we complete his plan of salvation that he gives for us in the holy days that we observe each year. What God's will is that salvation will come to all of mankind. He has called you and me now to that time. It's up to us to follow God, to yield ourselves, and to do the things that he expects us to do, in fact, commands us to do. As we're here at this Feast of Tabernacles, enjoy it, embrace it. Let it be an inspiration to you. Let it help hone your vision of the kingdom of God and let that motivate you through this feast and beyond that you are ever and ever more committed to God, committed to do his way exactly, diligently, and carefully, just as he says in the scriptures. Have a wonderful, wonderful, and meaningful feast, everyone. May God be with you all. Last night I lay sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice.
voice of angels from heaven and surround before the voice of angels from heaven and surround Jerusalem Jerusalem lift up your gates and sing Hosanna in the highest Hosanna to your The streets no longer ran Hushed were the glad hosannas The little children sang The sky grew dark with mystery The morn was cold and chill As the shadow of a stake arose Upon a lonely hill the shadow of the stake arose upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing, rose up.
incredible opening night. I think this is about my 58th or 59th opening night, and I don't think I've ever been so inspired, and I hope that's the, the same for each and every one of you. As we're settling just for a moment, I'll, I'll just mention a really brief thing. We often say that, that life is a circle, and to recognize that Susan and I have had an opportunity to come back here to, to circle. And uh, the gentleman down here, the young gentleman down here, Mark Graham, and his wife, Taya, used to be Susan's and my next-door neighbors, next-door neighbors, literally, on Marengo Avenue in Pasadena 45 years ago. And now here he and I are neighboring tonight to lead you in a song as we conclude the service. Let's please remember that services will be at 2 o'clock tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, 2 o'clock. And we look forward to seeing all of you again, plus we'll probably have others joining us. Again, we want to welcome those that are here for the very, very first time to hear a message like this tonight. And we want to welcome those that perhaps have not been for us for some time. And you're here tonight, and you've come back, and you've returned and you're special, and we look forward to meeting each and every one of you during the feast. I am going to call upon Mr. Uh, Miller to conclude in prayer as our coordinator uh, this evening, and uh, we've been given a lot of uh, homework and a lot of heart work uh, through the messages of Mr. Miller and uh, President Shaby this evening, and so let's all please rise and let's turn to page number 157. Because God does what he can do, and he's asking us to do something to be lights in this community, as we are community, to spread it out to others. So let's conclude singing this as disciples of Jesus Christ. By this shall all men know. Mark, any time. All together, here we go. A new commandment I will give to magnify the way to live. Love each other as you do. With the love I've given you. Thank you. 
Mr. Miller. Please bow your heads. Heavenly, eternal Father, we come before you, great God of the universe, and we are just so grateful as the full moon is shining upon us and as we gather on your holy festival that you established thousands of years ago for our learning, for bringing us together as a community, for building a family that will live on into eternity. We just pray now, Father, that we have, we have really started a good thing this evening. It's wonderful the number of people that have come here, that you've shown us, Father, that there are people that want to come before you and rejoice to keep your feast. We will fellowship together. We will eat together. We will fellowship around the campfire. And most of all, we will learn to fear you as you have instructed, and that is the main purpose of this feast. And we just pray, Father, that you would... Make this feast like the revival of Nehemiah when each day and every day they came before the Lord and they read from your word and were instructed and inspired by it. So we pray that you would bring us closer together through your spirit, that you would teach us and guide us. And we pray this through Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>